Hello class, Mr. Fino here. This is Unit 6, Lesson 2 on the, the Shang Dynasty. Uh, so here we have some of the masks that uh, people uh, in the Shang clan would have worn. Kind of weird looking. So in this section, you will learn what Shang artifacts revealed about ancient China. And look, looks like this is in a museum of some kind, but um, maybe a recreation or part of the um, ruins discovered at Anyang in 1928. All right, so the first question here is, how did the Shang come to power? Uh, the answer is, rival clans would battle for control of the Wanghe Valley, and the Shang took control about 3,772 years ago, so almost 4,000 years ago. Um, but much of the Shang uh, was long shrouded in legend until something occurred where um, artifacts were discovered, which shed more light, shed, shed some light on how they lived uh, back then. So here we see uh, the um, how, how the Shung Empire spread. You can see it with the kind of the yellow lines there throughout a bunch of the Huanghe Valley. And then the green is present day China. All right, so we have the discovery at Anyang in 1928. Um, so this is when they, you know, historians and archaeologists learned a lot about early Chinese culture, early Chinese civilizations. So the ruins included a palace, temple, houses, and artisan workshops. Um, so archaeologists discovered human bones underneath the palace. Uh, so you can see in the image here um, how they would have been, you know, put inside the... Uh, you know, they, they dug it out and they put them in and, they, you know, ramps led down to the tombs, as you can see here, where the king was buried with slaves, servants and animals. You can see horses were being buried. You can see people, um, servants, soldiers. Um, they believe the king needed to be served in the afterlife. That's the reasoning behind it. And the king was also buried with food and other important items. Um, that he would need in the afterlife. Even like chariots and stuff, they would, they would, uh, you know, bury him with with those things as well because they, they felt he needed them in the afterlife. Uh, next, we have Shung government. So the king established smaller kingdoms led by his younger brothers and nephews. All right, so you know, essentially nepotism, but uh, that's how many of these ancient ancient civilizations worked. It, it was, you know. Power ran in families. Uh, the Shang rulers were constantly at war to control other clans, right? These other clans might rise up, give, give them some trouble, so they were, they were constantly at war. Uh, prisoners of war, like these are probably in World War II, but same idea, were used for labor or human sacrifices, right? So those sacrifices they'd make to, the, to their ancestors, um, they would use prisoners of war. Uh, the army was made up of foot soldiers, archers, men on horses or elephants, and men on chariots. Um, and then chariots, how they were set up, there was three riders. There was the driver in the middle, a spear carrier on the left, and an archer on the right. So I'm going to show you an image here. You can see there's the driver, uh, spear carrier on one side, archer on the other side. Uh, how are people ranked in Shang society? So at the top, obviously, would be the king, top of the pyramid. Below that, nobles. And then below that, you've got kind of within, kind of they're kind of lumped together in a lot of ways, but artisans and traders are between the nobles and the farmers. So below the artisans and traders, you've got farmers, and then on the bottom, slaves. Uh, by far the biggest group, well, we'll talk about that. Uh, so we got the nobles right underneath the king. The nobles supplied the king with weapons, foot, foot soldiers, and chariots, right? So they, they got the king the materials he needed for war. And in exchange, the nobles received control of the land. I don't know if this is exactly what, what it would have looked like, but it's not a picture. Um, nobles lived in nice homes, like you can see here, and enjoyed frequent hunting. So... Um, wild animal bones have been excavated or dug up at burial sites. Um, and then oracle bones 
also describes scenes of nobles joining the king in hunts for animals like foxes, badgers, and other wild animals. Um, and then the king also gave nobles jade discs as symbols of power. So here you can see what hunting might have looked like. They didn't mention rhinoceros, uh, but I found this image. And then this is a jade disc. It lost its color largely, but um, this is what it would have looked like. All right, below the nobles, you have one of the groups of the artisans. And this group included potters, stonemasons, and bronze jade crafters. Um, so potters make like pot pottery, stonemasons work with stone. Um, but artisans skilled with bronze were especially valued because they could make weapons. Um, and they could also make fancy containers for the king and nobles to use in religious ceremonies or just to show that they were rich. But here we have some artisan work. I think this is probably jade on the left and bronze on the right, but I'm not 100% certain. Uh, here we have some bronze uh, weapons, so a bronze axe and then a br some bronze armor. We'll talk more about that in a bit. Uh, so in that kind of middle group underneath the nobles, you've got traders as well. Uh, it is believed that the Shang traded extensively. Uh, people mostly exchanged goods, but they also used these cowrie shells that you see here, uh, which they're a type of seashell as money. And the reason they used cowrie shells was because uh, they were valuable because they came from far away. And so you can see here what they look like. All right, below the traders, you've got farmers. And farmers were by far the largest group in Shang society. They grew crops like millet, wheat, barley, rice, fruit, vegetables, and nuts. Um, they didn't own the land, um, and they had to give up the crops to the king, to the nobles, sort of like taxes, and they could only keep enough food to survive. Uh, farmers, although bronze was huge in ancient China, they, used, they didn't really have bronze tools. They used simple tools made of stone and wood. Um, so they would, they would have dug with wooden sticks, weeded with stone-tipped hose, and harvested grain with stone knives and scythes. And then farmers also raised cattle, pigs, and chickens. All right, and at the bottom, we've got the slaves. Um, and many of those slaves were prisoners of war and spent their lives building tombs and palaces for the king. Um, and when their masters died, oftentimes many slaves were sacrificed with them. So pretty awful existence as a slave. Uh, Shung religion. So Shung religion centered on ancestor worship, right? The worship of your ancestors, the people that in your family that have died. Um, they believe their ancestors had the power to help or harm the living. So that was why they needed to show such respect to their ancestors. Um, and to do that, the Shung offered food and sometimes human sacrifices. So pretty extreme form of, of showing their praise to their ancestors. And they believed the king inherited his right to rule, right, from his predecessors, from his ancestors, and he could communicate with them. Um, continuing on for Shang religion here, kings use oracle bones to make big decisions, um, like when to hunt, where to build cities, and whether to go to war. Um, oracle bones were made from turtle shells, like here on the right, or the shoulder blade of a cow, like here on the left. And they were used by holy men who would either ask questions or make a statement, then heat up the bones, and then they had a way of um, reading the cracks to, to reveal messages that they would then use to make big decisions. Uh, we have Shung writing. So adv advanced Shung writing was logographic, where characters stood for words rather than sounds. But the earliest Chinese writing was pictographic, meaning that images stood for objects. So you can see here in the image um, how these things kind of look like what they are, like the bird here very much looked like a bird in Oracle Bone script of, of the early Shung. Um, tortoise very much looks like it. Um, and then they get more and more abstract as time goes on. Next we have Shung art. So Shung artists showed great skill in working with bronze. Um, they made vessels and animal masks known as te uh, teotis. So these are teotis here. They're kind of like animal masks. They had different animal forms and maybe the ears of a tiger or the, the beak of a of an owl, something like that. Um, and Shang artists also produce remarkable jade pieces as well. This is jade here. And then here we have a bronze sculpture. And 
I believe this is our last question. Why did the Shang, why did the Shang dynasty end? So being constantly at war weakened the military power of the Shang, right? They're spreading themselves thin, right? By trying to expand too much or defend too much territory. It was just too hard. Also, extravagant spending by the king and nobles weakened the economy. They wasted money. So eventually, a frontier state, probably kind of out, out in um, the outskirts of China, called the Zhou, rose up against the Shang. Um, Zhou armies under King Wu, who is pictured here, this handsome fellow, took over power from the Shang. And one story suggests that as the Zhou took the capital city, the Shang king ran from the battlefield, put on all his jewelry, and threw himself in the fire. So a fire, so <laughs> shows how corrupt it was towards the end. All right, so in this section, in conclusion, we learned about the Shang dynasty. We have a cool graphic here you can take, take a look at. Um, but thank you very much.